بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل نزله روح القدس من ربك بالحق ليثبت الذين آمنوا وهدى وبشرى للمسلمين ولقد نعلم أنهم يقولون إنما يعلمه بشر لسان الذي يلحدون إليه أعجمي وهذا لسان عربي مبين إن الذين لا يؤمنون بآيات الله لا يهديهم الله ولهم عذاب أليم إنما يفتر الكذب الذين لا يؤمنون بآيات الله وأولئك هم الكاذبون من كفر بالله من بعد إيمانه إلا من أكره وقلبه مطمئن بالإيمان ولكن من شرح بالكفر صدرا فعليهم غضب من الله ولهم عذاب عظيم ذلك بأنه مستحب الحياة الدنيا على الآخرة وأن الله لا يهدي القوم الكافرين ذلك بأنه مستحب الحياة الدنيا على الآخرة وأن الله لا يهدي القوم الكافرين أولئك الذين طبع الله على قلوبهم وسمعهم وأبصارهم وأولئك هم الغافلون لا جرم أنهم في الآخرة هم الخاسرون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات One short topic I'm sure many people in here would have asked the question at some point in time of their life What is the difference between a prophet a messenger a imam and the Rasul. So there is a Rasul and there is a Rasul as well. So a prophet of God, so there is sometimes, even in the Quran, it mentions, was there a time where there was no messengers? Rasul, Rasul. Yes, there was. But what would there have been? There would have been a prophet, Nabi. So a Nabi is someone that God tells him the message. God has chosen them and God has even um, um, chosen them specifically before this life. They are mu'minun. And then there is a higher rank. That's a messenger. So the messenger, God tells him, go tell the message to the people. That's Rasul. Now, Rasul usually has, how can you, how can you say it, successors or nuqaba in, in the Quran or imams. Prophet Moses السلام, had 12, Prophet Isa السلام, had 12, and many others also have imams. Um, God is the one who chooses, chooses the prophets. 
God subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, always uses the word ja'ilunaka to Prophet um, as the doctor mentioned to Prophet Dawood alayhi salam or ja'alna so God is the one who chooses them God is the one who in a subhum places them the Imams and the Prophets by the Wasiyah so the Imams they are leaders that's a higher rank so Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam when he passed the test then he became Imam a leader each Ummah has an Imam and Nabi Muhammad is the Imam of this Ummah so they come and say they come and say uh, you have to follow the Khulafa well who placed these Khulafa the Khulafa will tell you we made a majlis under a given roof not in the mosque not including uh, Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet and we chose him they're, they're very you know it's like face value. They take it at face value. They say, because he's a Sahabi, therefore we take him at face value. He must be good. Um, okay, what does the Shia say? They say, Ahlul Bayt themselves say, the Prophet, uh, me from my father, from his father, from the Prophet, from God. He's the one who placed me, he who chose me, who gave the wasiyah to the Prophet to me. So, with the Ahlul Bayt, it is not cut out. With the others, no, it is. So that is um, a very beautiful fact I found and I wanted to share with you brothers as well. Another thing would be one story about some brother who when he was in Iraq, he saw a little, a young boy and he saw him alone walking to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He asked him, my son, um, who are you coming with today? He's telling him, um, I'm just coming alone. Well, where is your father? Uh, no, my father died a few years pa a few years ago. Allah Um Okay, so where is your mother? My mother just died last year. So you're coming here alone? Yes, I'm coming here. How old are you, my son? He was asking him. He told him, I'm 10 years old. And I'm going alone to Ziyarat Imam Hussein alayhi salam walking. So he told him, how many times have you visited Imam Hussein alayhi salam so far? He wants to see the spirit of this boy. It looks like a strong spirit. He told him 11 times. He asked him, didn't you just tell me you're 10 years old? He told him, yes. Then how did you visit Imam Hussein alayhi salam 11 times? He told him, the first time I was in my mom's tummy, I was, uh, she was pregnant with me. She came and visited Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Then later on, when I was born, I came with my mother and father. God bless them. Then a bit, I became matured. I, w I was on the pram. They got me on the pram. And then I went with my father. When my father passed away, I came with my mother. And my mother just passed last year. And I'm coming now. And I will continue to come until the rest of my life. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam his love is like a message written in the hearts of the believers. And I thought that would be a touching story for me at least. Thank you for listening. And akhru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. صلوا على محمد وآل محمد In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Jazakallah khair brother Saeed for the presentation and the recitation of Al-Quran Al-Kareem before me And it actually reminded me of what brother Varuna was mentioning last night on Ziyarat Ashura how important this pilgrimage is and the remarkable effects that the recitation of Ziyarat Ashura has. Just a moment. 
صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد So, in one part that he mentioned, which I love, there's a part in Ziyarat Ashura, something along the lines of Allahumma, Mahyaya, Mahya Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad, wa Mamati, Mamata Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, let me live like Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad and let me die like Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wassalam. Such a powerful area, especially when we contemplate over it, especially. With the added context of no- and knowledge of how exactly these personalities lived, the virtues that they adhered to, the principles that they lived by, how firmly they clung on to those principles, even with all of the obstacles that attacked them from every direction. When you look at that, it inspires you to be better in life. This is what it truly means, not blankly reading. And this is the deeper level of Islam, which inshallah we can all get the opportunity to explore and benefit from. Inshallah, with that said, I'd like to invite our dear and respected Hajj Dr. Abdul Saad to deliver the main lecture for tonight. Please welcome him with three loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحن العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي صدق الله العلي العظيم صلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا إمام الحسين يا سيد الشهداء صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Uh, apologies for my absence last night and thank you to the brothers for covering uh, for me with the talk. Inshallah tonight we are going to discuss Karbala in context, the psychology of Satan. The previous two lectures we covered the psychology of the human, the psychology of Adam. And tonight we're going to delve deeper into the psychology of Satan <clears throat> according to the Quran, the psychology of shaitan, the deceiver. Satan is the grand deceiver. He is the grand trickster. And the Quran reveals the psychology of this uh, entity, of this force. And we can see that according to the Quran, shaitan is a master of deception, a master of misdirection, a master of misguidance. And one of the main methods of shaitan, one of the main uh, psychological tactics he uses, a form of warfare against humanity. If you've heard of the term psychological warfare, in Arabic, psychological warfare, is that he presents himself He feigns, he pretends to be a sincere advisor. It's noteworthy that Satan, in the Quran, deceives Adam by telling him that he can do better. Remember, Adam is in the garden, in a state of bliss, in a state that's free of shaqa. Free of hardship and adversity. Yet, shaitan, like the con man he is, is able to sell Adam a dream. Sell him an upgrade package that doesn't exist. To present himself as giving him a better deal than God. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فوسوس إليه الشيطان قال يا آدم هل أدلك على الشجرة الخلد وملك لا يبلى 
But Satan whispered to Adam, saying, Adam, shall I show you the tree of immortality and power that never decays? So we see here that Satan, Shaitan, is a trickster, a fraudster, a deceiver. One of the words we could use is a, a charlatan. Charlatan. A liar. Imagine this. Imagine you live in a penthouse. You live in a luxurious apartment. Right at the top of a building, full of luxury and comfort. But then someone comes along and convinces you that there is an even better apartment you could live in. And they're so convincing that you end up selling your apartment, giving up the title deed, the mortgage was fully paid off, you sell it, just based on a picture or an image of the new apartment that you're told you can move into. It hasn't even been built off the, off the plan. Only based on the drawings, very nice drawings, very realistic, maybe made with AI. And then you find it was all a fraud after you sell your apartment. You end up penniless, homeless and on the street, having been duped, conned, fleeced, defrauded. This is shaitan. Now, when are we most vulnerable to this satanic deception? Because this is where the psychology of the human merges with the psychology of shaitan. We are most vulnerable to the satanic deception when we have dropped in our level of awareness. We've dropped in our level of consciousness. And one of the negative emotional states that gives shaitan a foothold into our life is the emotion of fear. Fear. Fear is actually the master emotion that allows shaitan to gain a foothold into our kingdom. Fear. The tradesman who fears not making money. So he cuts corners. He uses poor quality material. He does a poor job, but he charges top dollar to do the waterproofing on a house. He cuts corners. He does not do the job with integrity. And months later, the family living in that home are affected by dampness in the walls and the leaking, the growth of mold. The children in the home develop respiratory problems due to the mold. This is Amal shaitan This is satanic. Satan tricks us, deceives us to take the easy path, the shortcuts, the path of immediate gratification. He promises us the world and makes us blind to the consequences of our actions. This is, this is satanic. Omar ibn Sa'd was offered the governorship of the kingdom of Ray, modern state, modern day Tehran in Iran by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad the governor of Kufa as an incentive to lead the army against Imam al Hussein salam during the events of Karbala so shaitan also is a seducer he sweetens the deal for you now Umar ibn Sa'ad initially hesitated to accept this task due to his reluctance to confront Imam al Hussein salam but he was seduced by the promise of this governorship, a, po a prosperous and significant region, and he was persuaded. We also see the influence of Satan infiltrating the psychology of the human in the example of a religious leader who fears his position will be undermined. So he begins to spread rumors and slander and engages in a smear campaign against those he perceives to be his opponents. Other clerics. The wife who fears her husband may be betraying her. So she starts to talk about her marriage problems to unscrupulous friends. Friends that lack integrity and family members that give the lady wrong advice amplify her anxiety 
and lead her down a path which eventually destroys her family. This is something that shaitan loves to do. He loves to destroy families. He loves to destroy, to destroy peace. Or the husband who, fear, who, fears, who feels insecure about his wife not respecting him. So he begins to treat her with harshness and unkindness. He starts talking to family and friends about his marriage and they give him the wrong advice. They tell him to treat his wife harshly and with coldness, leading the home situation to spiral out of control. So what I'm telling you here is shaitan often comes to us in the form of an advice giver. Isn't that how he came to Adam? As an advice giver, will I guide you to this tree that will give you everlasting life and great power? He came as an advice giver, like a good guy. Satan often comes to us in the form of an advice giver. And when do we seek advice? Often when we're fearful, confused, distressed. Adam was deceived by Shaitan, who came to him disguised as a sincere advice giver. Now we can speculate that Adam, at the time of the deception, was suggestible to being deceived. This is a very important word. He was suggestible. He was open to suggestion. Suggestibility is a term used in psychology. In the context of sales, marketing and hypnosis, how suggestible are you? To this marketing technique how suggestible are you to being hypnotized how suggestible a person is means how easy is it to influence them which means for them to be influenced to experience certain emotions and those emotions weaken the akal, weaken the intellect which open up the person to make decisions that are not in their favor Like to buy something that they don't need, to invest in something that's not good for them, to do an act that is um, adverse or has a negative consequence to their spirit. To do things that are not in their best interest. This is suggestibility. Fear is a master emotion which makes you suggestible. We went through a pandemic for, I don't know how long, two years, two and a half years, and the fear was cranked up. Now that the fear has resolved, many people have can think more clearly about what happened and some of the unscrupulous strategies governments used to influence the behavior of the population, which now the psychologists have said, yes, we advise the government how to make the population fearful so that they would engage in certain behaviors that if they were thinking more clearly, they would not do. Right? This was masterminded. If I can make you fearful of losing something, missing out on something, I have a high chance of influencing your behavior. And then I can suggest to you what you need to do to avoid the feed outcome. Like Shaitan did to Adam. You want a better deal? You want immortality? You want power? Do this. I'm, I'm going to give you the upgrade package. You know what a Ponzi scheme is? It's like a Ponzi scheme, right? You can look it up for those watching online on the audience. P-O-N-Z-I, Ponzi scheme. Satan tricked Adam by offering him eternal life. Now we can speculate that Shaitan was able to instill some form of fear in Adam the fear of losing out on an opportunity to have immortal life and power. But look at how much of a con man shaitan is. Adam was already in the garden of bliss. Adam, wasn't he already in the garden of bliss when he was deceived? Yet he fell under the suggestion of shaitan who managed to convince him that he could get an upgrade on his situation, that he could do better. Just like the example of the apartment I mentioned earlier, the guy living in the penthouse, who sells it for what he's told is a better apartment that's off the plans. And he ends up being fleeced, homeless, and penniless. In psychology, this can refer to something called the gambler's fallacy. 
the gambler's fallacy. It is the psychology of a gambler who keeps taking bets, hoping he can do better, hoping he can win more, hoping only to find that he loses everything and sinks into a deep depression, having to return to his family in disgrace after blowing all his money, feeling extreme guilt and regret. And this is why Allah SWT says that gambling is rijsun min amal shaitan It is one of the abominations of Satan's handiwork. It's one of the tools of shaitan, gambling. So, if we want to protect ourselves from shaitan, if we want to buffer ourselves, one very important practical piece of advice is we have to be aware who do we seek advice, nasiha from, when we are confused, have fear, have doubt, or in a state of crisis. This is a very important point for when we are emotional, fearful, upset, have doubts, or are confused, we are susceptible to bad advice and being misled or misguided. It is incredibly important whenever we are navigating any sort of crisis in our life that we only turn to people who we trust for advice, who have a track record of being wise and prudent, who are emotionally balanced and will, and will not take advantage of us by using our situation as a source of gossip or giving us bad advice that lacks wisdom and makes the situation worse. For this is one of the footholds of Satan into our lives, Satan being the deceiving, misguiding force. Yusuf's brothers, alayhi salam, Yusuf, alayhi salam, his brothers plotted to kill him because they were afraid of his status. They envied the close position he had with Nabi Yaqub, alayhi salam, so that they feared that he would be given a high status and that they would lose out. So they conspired to get rid of Yusuf alayhi salam. Now when Yusuf alayhi salam is reunited with his father and his brother Benjamin, as well as the brothers that conspired to kill him, what does Yusuf say? Yusuf alayhi salam says, مِن بَعْدِ أَن نَزَغَ الشَّيْطَانُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ إِخْوَتِي after Satan sowed discord between me and my brothers, Yusuf a.s. blames Shaitan for what happened, not his brothers. Satan sowed discord between me and my brothers. Satan sows discord, enmity, conflict, strife between a husband and wife. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Satan sows discord, enmity, conflict, strife between a husband and wife, between siblings, between community leaders. The Adamic creature the Quran introduces us to was highly susceptible to being deceived by shaitan. Now here's a very important point. Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, we see, was not suggestible at all to the misguidance, deception, seduction, trickery or bribes of Satan. He remained absolutely steadfast, absolutely resolute. He maintained absolute azm that this Adamic creature in the Quran could not maintain. The Adam representing you and me. And this once again positively proves that Imam al Hussein as a member of the purified progeny of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ali. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ali Muhammad. As a member of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, stands in total distinction to the entire created Adamic order. And that he is a member of a household that stands above the entirety of the Adamic creation. At the peak, at the apex of the human created order. <coughs> he no doubt is a servant of Allah. He is a creation of Allah. He's not divine. But he stands at the absolute pinnacle of the human created order, along with his grandfather, father, brother and mother, alayhim salatu wassalam. 
at the helm of this entire universe where we started our lectures a week ago is Allah Azza wa Jal. And directly beneath Allah, given authority over this entire universe, Wilaya is Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He is given wilaya, guardianship, jurisdiction over all of creation. And he is sent as a mercy to the entire cosmic order, to all worlds known and unknown. And this wilaya is directly given in that vertical chain of authority to Ali ibn Abi, Ta- ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam who after the departure of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi was given this jurisdiction and directly after him it was given to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam and then Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam and then Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam then to Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam Imam al-Qadim alayhi salam Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam Imam al-Askari alayhi salam and finally to Al-Qa and the master of our age, Imam Muhammad al-Mahdi alayhi salam, ajal Allah ta'ala farjahu al-sharif. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Is it any wonder that shaitan launched his most daring, brazen, flagrant attacks against this holy household? Satan and his confederates the conscripts, conscripts he co-opted from the humans who he seduced and misguided to sell out their akhirah, to sell out their loyalty, their fidelity to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi after coming to an undeniable recognition of the status of Imam Ali alayhi salam. As the Shia of Ali alayhi salam, we repudiate Hizb al-Shaytan and it is incumbent upon us not to succumb to the misguidance False promises, seductions, and deceptions of this anti-Khalifa, anti-human, anti-Adamic entity who unsuccessfully sought to destroy the progeny of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. So we pray for the reappearance of the great grandson of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to exact divine vengeance on all the criminals who conspired against Ahlul Bayt And may we be in our conduct, in our character, and in our life, may we be amongst those who do not follow Hizb al-Shaytan while professing with our tongues to love and follow Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So before I conclude my final thoughts, in order to inoculate ourselves against the deceptions of shaitan, the the suggestions of shaitan, it's very important, my brothers and sisters, that we have skills to regulate our emotions. That we learn skills to maintain a balanced emotional state throughout the day. Because shaitan gets us when we, when, we, when we have the emotional hubut, when we descend into lower emotional states, such as fear, extreme guilt, extreme shame, extreme forms of anger that border on rage and, and, and violence. These are called low vibration, low frequency emotions. And it's at these lower frequencies that, that the shayateen live. They inhabit these lower frequencies. That's why you find someone gripped with fear and anger and rage and venom and vice. They become attracted to vile acts, vile thoughts, vile words. Right? So it's going to be very important in your life that you learn skills to regulate your emotions. To keep yourself in a higher vibration. Now what sorts of things can keep us in a higher vibration? The connection to the holy ones, the connection to the sources of the sacred, being as much as we can in a state of tahara, purity, being on wudu throughout the day, um, drinking pure water, eating clean foods. This has an impact on your psychological and spiritual state. 
Because everything you eat has a vibration. So reducing your intake doesn't mean you can never have snacks or junk food, but moderating your impact of these things. Drinking clean water instead of sodas and sugary drinks. Eating high quality foods. Eating, eating cleanly. Right? Moving your body. Uh, exposing yourself to high frequency, high vibration material such as Quran, uh, Anashid, Latmiya, uh, beautiful recitations of Ziyarat, right? Avoiding things that create a lower or negative vibration. The other thing that's very important to keep shaitan at bay is being very prudent with who you share your problems with. Now, we are social creatures. We need to talk to other humans. It's very healthy to talk to someone, a friend, a parent, a trusted advisor, even a therapist, a coach or a counselor. But you have to be prudent. Prudent means you have to be wise. Don't open up your, the problems in your life just to anyone that will listen. Random people. Your average person, my brother and sister, with respect, is pretty clueless. A random person on the street. You open up to them about your marital problems, about things that are affecting you, this person may not have the capacity to guide you. Right? They may inadvertently misguide you and sometimes people on purpose misguide people. Do you want an example of that? Interested in an example? Here's a controversial example. Many um, women will misguide other women when it comes to the topic of marriage. They will project their failures in their life onto a young lady and give her the wrong advice. Because that lady has suffered in her life or that lady has, been, had, has had a bad experience with men and she sees a younger sister and something in the heart comes and says, you know what, it might be unconscious. It's like I'm going to give her the advice but that advice is going to lead her to miss an opportunity or that advice might lead her to destroy her marriage. Right Now, sometimes it's malicious. Often it isn't, but sometimes it is. We're complex as humans. So I'm not advocating that people become paranoid. I'm advocating that you be prudent. Who do you share your problems with? So what are the, what are the features that you know someone has got wisdom or hikmah if you share a problem with them? Here are some signs to look for, that someone is wise and is worthy of you seeking their counsel, their advice. Number one, after you talk to them, you feel better. They're not going to say, yes, you're right, that was awful and that person's a narcissist and you should get divorced if it's a marital problem. They're going to say, oh, okay, I'm really sorry to hear that. What's been happening? What have you tried? What's going on? They're going to try to validate and understand. They're going to ask questions. They're going to try to wisely understand the situation from multiple perspectives. They may even challenge your perspective. You may be convinced that you're the victim and this person's bad and say, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's just think this through. Rather than immediately taking your side. Now, it may be justified that you've been victimized or wronged, but it may not be helpful for you right, to just hear one side of the story or be in an echo chamber. So one, one of the signs that you're dealing with a wise person is they're going to get you to develop a more balanced perspective on the problem. They're not going to immediately collude with you and amplify your fear and amplify your anger and, and get you all right. They're going to say, hey, let's, let's calm down. Let's look at the situation. Another feature of a wise person that is worthy of you seeking their advice or counsel is that they're going to help point out your strengths. How, what capacity do you have to deal with the situation? They might give you some practical ways forward. They're never going to profess that they have the exact answer. This is exactly what you should do. They're going to make suggestions. They're going to say, you might consider trying this. They're going to aim, whenever possible, if there's a conflict with another human, for a peaceful resolution. They're going to be transparent. 
They're not going to want to play games and triangulation and let me talk to them, but then I won't tell you what happened, and then it gets like a bit of a gossip party. They're, they're really going to be someone that's going to wish that you haven't come to them. It's going to feel like a burden because they hate to see that you have this problem. It's actually going to be, it's going to be, it's going to sadden them that you're going through this versus, oh, give me all the juice. You know, what happened? Give me the forensic detail. This is not a good sign. I want to just lap it up, all the detail, like a drama now. This is part of the psychology of shaitan. Now, I'm not saying a person that does this is, is shaitan or a shaitan. I'm saying this is how shaitan sows discord, enmity. Nabi Yusuf salam, says, it was the work of shaitan that sowed discord between me and my brothers. Well, look what they did. Attempted murder, throwing Yusuf in the well, alayhi salam. Sabbat Make it a song and dance and extract information and use it for gossip and make it their whole life. That's not healthy. A person who gives you wise nasiha wants to help you to be on your way. I want to help you. I, I, I hate that you're in this situation. How can I help you? How can I give you some advice? How can I help you just and listen to you and maybe find a way to resolve this peacefully? Someone might come to you with a conflict in our community between two brothers or religious scholars or leaders. Don't pile it on. Say, yeah, I disagree with this uh, scholar and I disagree with that he doesn't support this. And I say, no, 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 no. You are now colluding with Hezbo Shaitan. You are creating strife. If you have an opinion, you can offer it in the correct academic context. But that's usually going to be rare. Most people are going to be dogmatic and have positions. They're going to be like a boxing match. Shaitan has made our community here lose so much. In our mosques and in our centers. It, we've lost so much potential. So much of the young brothers and sisters. So many missed opportunities. You don't think Shaitan is active in the community? He's very active. He takes people down. He makes a young brother doubt himself. You're never going to get married or it's too hard. Or He makes a young sister doubt herself. And by the way, one of the main arrows of shaitan that I see with the sisters, I'm going to address the sisters and the brothers. I'm talking freely now, no notes. One of the main arrows of shaitan I'm seeing with our sisters is the arrow of pride. I'm better than this brother. He doesn't earn as much. He can't give me the $100,000 wedding. I'm the prize. Shaitan dangles the carrot in front of her, then you're 35, 36, 37, 38. It's like, oh my God. <sighs> Miss the bus. Miss the bus. Pride. We may not like to hear this. I'm not accusing every sister. I'm not doing that, but some sisters have succumbed to such a level of hubris, such a level of grandiosity, that a normal brother working a normal job, not good enough. She wants the Instagram dream. Okay, this is shaitan. He sells you the dream, and in the end leaves you penniless. You say, wait, Lana, wait, my God, why, 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 why? Time's up. Shaitan's happy. Or the, so pride is a big one. Now, am I impugning all our sisters? No. There are sisters that are very sweet, very humble. Truly have the akhlaq of Sayyid al-Zahra in our community. And many of them are hard done by, by the brothers who do not see their worth. And compare them to these proudful sisters unfairly. So pride is a big one. What's one, of the, what's one of the main arrows that shaitan is using against our brothers in the community? 
Who can tell me what it is? If it's pride against the sisters, puffed up, the cupboard, arrogance, what is it with the brothers? That's not the one I'm thinking of, but that's certainly one, low self-esteem. It, it, the one I'm thinking of starts with L. L-U. Lust. Un, uh, unquenchable desire. Constant obsession with lust and Images and videos and obsession. Lust. You know that being in a constant state of lust, is that masculine? It's not masculine at all. Lust is one of the main weapons. And what does lust do to a young man? Does it make him more masculine or less masculine? Less. He's obsessed. He's weak. He can't even look at a girl in the eye. That's one of the main weapons of shaitan for our brothers, lust. And it's a big one. It's a, it's a big, it's not easy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Zuyyina lil nasi hubbu shahawati min nisa It's the first thing Allah lists. That the greatest thing that man desires on earth, min nisa Number one, the woman. And then Allah lists other things. Well, Banin, and then sons. You want legacy. You want kids. And hoarded heaps of gold and silver and well-tilled land. You know, your investment properties. But the number one is women. Lust. Lecherousness. Licentiousness. So the brothers are paralyzed by lust and are becoming emasculated and obsessive and the sisters are being attacked with pride and are getting so puffed up shaitan happy or unhappy with that very happy why is he happy he's destroyed the whole dynamic between man and woman and it may not be appropriate for me to go into more details on this sacred mimbar about what that's looking like. That's for another venue. But what I want to tell the sisters is my dear sisters who may be listening to this. I'm not telling you to be so humble that you settle for less or you you be with someone that, uh, you know, you feel like you're getting a raw deal. I'm not saying that. I don't want people to marry people because they feel like they have to. But what I'm saying is Let's, let's, what's the word? Let's detoxify ourselves from the scourge of the Kardashians. These disgusting, despicable people, these shayateen, right? These influences, despicable people, horrible people, awful people. Who are the conscripts of shaitan? Themselves victims of shaitan. I don't see them as, as necessarily evil. They're victims. They're possessed. You think they're happy? These influences? But they're becoming the role models for many of the sisters. That if you meet a brother that maybe earns fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year, just starting out in life, young brother, nothing wrong with him, handsome, fit, works out, no, not good enough. Because he can't give me the wedding that's going to be worthy of the Instagram reels. Shaitan. Or the brother so consumed by lust that his mind is distorted. He's lost touch with his masculinity. And the antidote to these things is not hard. Shaitan wants us to convince us it's so hard. No, first of all, awaken, be aware that I'm getting programmed by this garbage. So for the sisters... You want to give yourself an edge in the modern day marriage market? Detoxify yourself from the influencer, prideful, toxic mentality. You'll immediately be more feminine. You'll immediately, immediately be more attractive to the right guy. You'll be a winner. 
Shaitan doesn't want you to win. He's going to convince you that what's available isn't good and you can do better. You can do better. Like he tried to convince Adam. You can do better. Adam's in the garden of bliss and he convinced our father that he can do better. You get it now? This is shaitan. You can do better. You can keep, keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting. And this is the psychology of a lot of the sisters. I can do better. I can do better. It's like, uh-oh, there's no one left. You got played. You got played. For the brothers, practically, it is understanding that this issue of lust cannot be... Uh, what's the word? Beaten. Cannot be defeated purely by willpower, brothers. This is a very powerful force. You need to get on your knees. You need to turn to Allah and say, Ya Allah, this thing is getting to me. I try and I try. You need to call out to our Imma and ask for their intercession. Nadi Ali and Mudhir al Ajaib. Ya Ali, Ya Ali. And of course, we're not praying to Imam Ali as Allah. Ya Ali, is Ali Allah. Oh Ali, ask Allah on my behalf. You can say it in English. Due to the incredible closeness you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Ali, ask Allah to strengthen me. Ya Ali, ask Allah to make you one of my advisors to make you one of my personal that you be my master that you give me guidance by the permission of Allah you want to beat this on your own you know how weak your willpower is you think anyone can beat an addiction through their willpower there has never been a human on earth that beat an addiction through willpower there has never been an alcoholic or a gambler or any it always is beaten through a spiritual awakening so don't expect yourself to do it with the willpower. So the brothers have to take the sword of Ali against lust and reclaim their manhood. And the sisters have to pick up the tasbih of Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam and reclaim their femininity and their dignity and their softness. Not softness as in you're a doormat, sisters. No, a femininity that is strong. Sayyidah Zahra was no, was no weakling, astaghfirullah. When she needed to stand up, she stood up against the tyrants. She gave her arguments when they usurped her land, which was an act of criminal economic warfare against the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam, because Fadak was an extremely profitable piece of land. That's another story. The conspiracy that was that, that that initial government did. An act of absolute treacherous warfare. But we have to get back to basic because Shaitan is having an absolute field day with this community. He is having a field day. And we are like sitting ducks, unaware. Every year we come to commemorate Abu Abdullah alayhi salam and, and we, inshallah, Allah will bless us. But what is the point if for 355 other days shaitan is playing, playing with us? We're like little ducks. We're like pawns for him. You know pawns in chess? Wake up, my brothers. Wake up, my sisters. My sisters, please, this pride, this takabbur, this ujub, is, le is going to leave and will leave many of you miserable. And my brothers, this lust will leave many of you emasculated, a shadow of yourself. Our role models are Ali alayhi salam, Rasulullah alayhi salam, and Imat al-Masumin alayhi salam, alayhim as salam, Fatimat al-Zara alayhi salam, Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, and we all fall short, I fall short. Please never look at a, at, a, at a lecturer at Ashura as some angel from heaven. I fall short. I'm human. If I'm giving you the nasiha, I am the most in need of it. Believe me, I'm human like you. So do not hero worship anyone. Do not idealize any human on a member. We are all flawed. 
our ultimate guides, Ahlul Bayt salam. If I've shown anything these past eight nights, is that they are at the absolute pinnacle of the created order. They are our masters. My brothers and sisters, we'll leave it there. I'm not sure, Brother Hussein, whether you want to take any questions or shall we just wrap up for now? You let me know. You had one question? Okay. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد So my Father question here. was I was um, thinking about what you mentioned earlier of course the idea of seeking overcoming your obstacles or your addictions yes. through willpower as opposed to you know like or dua to yes, Allah seeking guidance, Allah. seeking guidance. Yes. yes. So, I think there doesn't the way I've seen it doesn't necessarily have to be a conflict between the two. It can all like the way I've seen it. You put your willpower in there, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and Perfect. the Ahlul Bayt amplify that willpower. Perfect. Perfectly stated. Yes, your willpower is energized, is vitalized, because your willpower on the horizontal plane is now plugged in. To the vertical plane. So it's like you're plugging in the power from a higher vibration. Yeah, so I'm saying that your willpower on its own is not enough. But in concert with tawassul, in concert with con with your contact with the sacred, with the purified progeny, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the ziyara, with the Quran, with 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 the uh, dhikr is amplified. It's like it's like turbo mode. Running on all cylinders. Yeah, that's a great distinction. Thank you, Hash Hussain. Any other questions? Um, on the topic of um, Shaitan playing tricks on you mentally, uh, yes. this is probably a question I've struggled for a while, and I would probably it's probably best to ask you since you're a psychologist. Um, how do we differentiate between like what's worse and your own ungodly thoughts, like such as like anxiety or like a chemical imbalance in your brain? How do you differentiate between um, like when Shaitan's talking or when it's just your own like self-doubt or your own self-talking in a negative manner? Well, one of the... I, I can't give you an absolute um, ironclad way, but one of the guides I can give you comes from the Quran and the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Shaitan leads us to fahsha. So if there are, if there are deeds or sins that are sacrilegious in nature that degrade you, that lead you to the depths of loss of self-respect. Um, probably there is an element of the satanic or the wiswas. So in general, we could say the whole pornographic industry is from Amal al-Shaytan, the gambling industry. So that's as a general rule, but that doesn't mean that now you need to say, is this from Shaytan or is this from me? Really the distinction there becomes an academic one. Generally, it's saying, okay, this thing that I'm doing, is it good for me? Is it in line with my dignity and my self-respect? But I would say that the more satanic elements is the more de de depraved and sacrilegious and extreme, where you, you really lose respect for yourself and you forget yourself, as Imam al Hussein said to them on the, on the plains of Karbala when he returned and said to the companions that this is a nation whom Satan has prevailed over them and has made them forget the remembrance of Allah because look what, they, look what they're doing. Look at the sacrilegious, vile acts. And as Imam Ali salam says, when Satan has hatched in their bosom his eggs, these vile acts become alluring to them, vile deeds, disgusting things. So usually the more extreme and more depraved the more that shaitan has a role or that's his arena, that's his industry, that's his area. Pornography, gambling, alcoholism, child abuse, extreme graphic images. There's also shaitan. Genocide. Shaitan. Extreme acts of violence in a home. A husband committing extreme violence against his wife, terrorizing his children. Shaitan. Satanic. This is the satanic element in our lives. Right? All right, brother? Any other questions? Uh, 
yes um i just wanted to give the comment but alongside with it would be my thoughts as well uh, so women that wanted marriage from what i've heard is that they were told to read hadith al-kisa okay um and within 40 days someone suitable would come along and it turns out that they have uh, their trust works out and it it works out as a good marriage so it seems like as you're saying it doesn't just connect them to the vertical plane the holy uh, but also purifies them yes and so that's one way at least for the sisters now for the brothers i haven't heard much but okay we have our own ways i guess lay off the bad stuff i guess stop getting visually stimulated so you can get your mojo back as a man yes (laughs) many things yeah (laughs) that's one thing okay very good Thank you, Brother Said. Anyone else? We're done? Okay. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Dear and respected Hajj, Dr. Abdul Saad, for that incredible lecture and the Q&A that followed. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, it guides us all to shift our mindset in life, make different choices, think better of ourselves. And if we are too prideful, inshallah to remove that pride find the right balance and equilibrium that we need in our lives inshallah tonight is the martyrdom of our beloved alamdar abbas ibn ali ibn abi talib alayhim salatu was salam may the peace and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon him other than imam al hussein alayhi salam perhaps the one that moves the heart, that stirs the heart, that pierces the heart more than any in Karbala is Abbas ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. The flag bearer of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, the backbone of his army, the one who was to Imam al Hussein as Imam Ali was to the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. He was called Bab al Hussein the gate of Imam al Hussein, just as Ali was the gate of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, stalwart, steadfast, firm in his loyalty, his duty, his commitment to Abi Abdullah al Hussein until the very end, following his every command to the letter. All of the family of Imam al Hussein that have fought on the plains of Karbala have been killed except for. Abbas. Abbas is the only one left. Ali al-Akbar has been slain. Qasim has been slain. Aun and Muhammad have been slain. And Abbas, peace and blessings be upon him, is the one who remains behind. He is eager to fight. He urges Imam al hussein give me permission. My brother, let me fight against this enemy. My master, Sayyidi. Imam al hussein does not give Abbas permission to fight. He gives him permission instead to fetch the water. And this is why Abbas is called Abu Qirba, the father of the water skin. Abbas gallops towards the enemy forces who are guarding the Furat, the Euphrates River. 4,000 enemies, enemy soldiers guarding the Furat. Abbas, peace and blessings be upon him, charges straight through them. He breaks through their ranks and he reaches the Furat with ease, he kneels down, Abbas, peace and blessings be upon him, kneels down and he lifts the water within the palms of his hand. And as he sees that water, 
he remembers back to the words of Amir al muminin his father admonishing him, telling him not to drink. He remembers the thirst of Sukaina, Salamullahu alayha al Atash al Atash. Abbas does not drink the water from the river. The history tells us that he is in such pain, such agony right now because of the thirst and heat of Karbala. He has not drank for days upon days. His heart feels like burning ash and yet he does not drink from the Furat. He drops the water back inside the river and Abbas, peace and blessings be upon him, gathers the water inside the water skin instead and he continues his journey back to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. peace and blessings be upon him. None of the enemies can come near him. Everyone who comes close to him cuts him down. Everyone who is face to face is struck down by the sword of Abbas ibn Ali, this mighty warrior, this backbone of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. But there are those who do not fight face to face. There is a man who comes to Abbas from behind and he cuts the right hand of Abbas ibn Ali. And Abbas ibn Ali does not waver. He says, by Allah, if you cut off my right hand, I will continue this journey. And Abbas ibn Ali gathers the water skin inside his left hand. He continues marching forward. And then another man comes behind and cuts off the left hand of Abbas ibn Ali. Brothers and sisters, these were the hands that were kissed by Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib when Abbas ibn Ali was just a baby. Amir al muminin knew that these hands would be given in the service of his Imam al Hussein. He knew these hands would be given in the service of his son Hussein by Abbas ibn Ali. He kissed these tiny hands when they were so young and now they were struck down, severed from his body. Abbas continues his journey forward. He continues forward, but the arrows are flying, the rocks are flying. One of the arrows, brothers and sisters, it pierces the eye of Abbas. It pierces the eye of Abbas and he falls off. He is struck on the back of the head by an iron pole. He is struck on the back of the head and with the arrow still lodged in his eye. When Abbas falls, he falls upon his eye. And as he falls, the arrow pierces through his skull. Abbas has fallen upon the battlefield and Imam al Hussein rushes towards his side. He rushes towards the side of his brother. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam is in tears and he cries, My back is broken. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam places Abbas on his lap and he tells his brother, he tells him, because Abbas السلام, tells him, My master Sayyidi, I have failed you. And Imam al Hussein tells him, with his final breath, Imam al Hussein tells Abbas ibn Ali that do not call me master, for once call me your brother. And Abbas ibn Ali, in his dying breath, he calls Imam al Hussein والسلام, his brother before he is taken from this world, before his soul departs. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Inshallah, please rise for Latam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Hussein ya Mawla, 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 Hussein ya Mawla. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Barakallah, Bikum, Jazakum Allah, Khairan Jazak. Aflah Ahmad Salla Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sadiqi Al-Abadi wa
وداعا يا عضدي يا ركني في الشدد عباس يا سندي من بعدك اشتعلت روحي وما سكنت وزينب ضربت وبعدها سبيت من بعدك اشتعلت روحي وما سكنت وزينب ضربت وبعدها سبيت يا أخي الحبيب أنت أنت لي طبيب أشرق الدماغ ثم سرت للمغيب إننا هنا يا أخي هنا غريب يا أخي الحبيب ساقي الحرام قمر العشيرة ساقي الحرام قمر العشيرة ساقي الحرام قمر العشيرة يا حسين حسين يا حبيب فاطمة يا حسين حبيب فاطمة يا حبيب فاطمة يا حسين يا حبيب يا حسين حسين يا حسين آه يا حبيب فاطمة يا حسين يا حسين حسين يا ابو فاضل يا عباس يا ابو فاضل يا عباس يا ابو فاضل يا عباس يا ابو فاضل ايه يا ابو فاضل ايه يا ابو فاضل إيه ويذا شيعة تدين كذا ويذا شيعة تنايت كذا سان أوف علي وي أول ريمبر يا أبو فاضل يا عباس يا أبو فاضل يا أبو فاضل إيه يا أبو فاضل We till down our heads, shall mourn together. We till down our heads, shall mourn together. We'll cry for the son of Haidar, of Haidar. Ya Abu Fadl, ya Abbas, ya Abu Fadl, ya Abu Fadl, ya Abu Fadl. Abbas at your birth, Ali would cry. Abbas at your birth, Ali would cry. He pulled the tears for the day you die, the day on which the sands you'd lie. Your hands cut off an arrow in your eye. Ya Abu Fadl, Ya Abbas, Ya Abu Fadl. Ya Abu Fadl. Eh, ya Abu Fadl. Eh, my need to reach the cool water. My need to reach the cool water in order to get for Hussein's daughter. Ya Abu Fadl. Ya Abu Fadl. And six months son, and for his six months son called Azgar, and for your beloved Hussein Master, Ya Abu Fadl, 
شاء الله يا ابو فاضل وي ذا شيعا شو نبا اندرستاند وي ذا شيعا شو نبا اندرستاند هاو ويت فور فور يو تو فول اون ذات لاند يا ابو فاضل يا عباس يا ابو فاضل يا ابو فاضل On the scorching, on the scorching, and red hot sands without your two right and left hands. Ya Abu Fadl, Ya Abbas, Ya Abbas, Ya Abu Fadl, Ya Abu Fadl, Ya Abbas. حسين يا مولا 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 هل من ناصر ينصرنا هل من ناصر ينصرنا هل من ناصر ينصرنا هل من ناصر ينصرنا My arms bear the flag of Islam I come from the sacred land I carry the blood of Haydar The great victor of Haybar My arms bear the flag of Islam I come from the sacred land. I carry the blood of Haydar, the great victor of Haybar. Hal hal min nasr yan yasurna. 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 Hussein, forgive me. I tell you. In the end, I could not break through. Ya Hussein, let me raise my sword. Your enemies' hearts are so cold. Let me soak the sands therein with their blood and all of their sins. Ya Hussein, let me raise my sword. Your enemies' hearts are so cold. Let me soak the sands therein with their blood and all of their sins. My faith in Allah won't cease. My soul will not be at ease till I find Sukaina water. My heart will always falter. Hal hal min nasir yan yasurna. Hal hal min nasir yan yasurna. Hal hal min nasir yan yasurna. Hal hal min هل هل من ناصر ينصرنا هل هل من ناصر ينصرنا هل هل من ناصر ينصرنا ينصرنا I cut straight through the enemies till I reach the Euphrates. My heart feels like burning ash, but all I hear is. Attach, so Kena's cries break my heart. Her voice tears my soul apart. Till she drinks, I won't quench my thirst. I could never be so cursed. Hal hal min nasr in yan yasurna. Hal hal min nasr in. Hal hal min nasr in. Hal hal min nasr in yan yasurna. Ya Allah, let me reach the camp. So Kena's eyes are so damp. Let me give her her. Let me give her a sip to drink. If I fail, my heart will sink. Ya Allah, let me reach the camp. So Kena's eyes are so damp. Let me give her a sip to drink. If I fail, my heart will sink. Hal hal min nasr in yan yan surna. Hal hal min nasr in yan yan surna.
Hussein, forgive me, I failed you in the end, I could not break through. The enemies cut my hands, my great flag fell upon the sands. My brother, do not shed tears, please forgive me, my death draws near. Hussein, I live to serve you, now I die among these pure few. توجه لا زيارة